broadcasting from the KMF Collective Studio, it's time for the Keep Moving Forward podcast. Join us every week as we dive into the stories of remarkable current and former athletes that have transitioned into the real world. Now here's your host, Katie Galley. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 237th episode of the Keep Moving Forward podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. In the KMF Collective studio with me today, I have CrossFit Level 3 trainer, CrossFit Headquarters staff member, and head coach at CrossFit Rife, Lindsay Andrew. How are you doing, Lindsay? Hey, I'm doing wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, thank you, Lindsay, so much for stopping by and sharing your story with us today. Uh, no problem. I uh, enjoy it or I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting about it. Well, me too. And so, Lindsay, just to get the ball rolling and um, to know your background a little bit, can you share with us where you grew up and how, if at all, was your childhood shaped by athletics? Okay. So this is super interesting because uh, it, it was a little bit, but really when CrossFit entered my life is when things kind of like took over. Um, however, growing up, uh, so I was a swimmer. Um, so I started swimming when I was like three years old and then I was on swim team, um, until like my freshman year of high school from like eight years old until like my freshman year of high school. So that was my, that's my athletic background. I did some other things too, but that was like, that was my thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, with swimming, once high school came, did you just decide you didn't want to swim anymore? Did you try your hand at other sports or was kind of your athletic career on pause until you found CrossFit? Yeah, it was kind of impossible. I found CrossFit because uh, I had uh, I had some, you know, I, I went through a little juvenile delinquent phase there for a little <laughs> bit, and I wanted to do I wanted to do other things. And so yeah, but um, yeah, it was on pause until uh, till really till CrossFit. Absolutely. Wow. And so, um, Lindsay, how then did you set up on that trajectory? So from high school and then going in, um, you know, into college years and then beyond. How did you find yourself into this world? Because I mean, having being a swimmer and then not really having athletics be that huge part of your life, but then getting thrust so heavily into this world of CrossFit. How did you, how did you do that? (laughs) Yeah. So this is, this is hilarious to me. So, um, obviously I've competed at at regionals. Um, but to me, it's, it's funny to me because if you would have told me, you know, 15 years ago that I would be teaching fitness and public speaking for a living, I would have laughed in your face because I was, (laughs) I was, um, you know, after swimming, which I absolutely loved, I just really didn't, I wasn't like a fitnesser. I wasn't, um, I did outside things and I sporadically like rock climbed and did some other stuff like that, but nothing super consistent until CrossFit. So CrossFit, uh, came about when I was living in Las Vegas and I had a very different lifestyle. I was bartending on the strip. And, um, one of my coworkers, like at that time, it was like really only like fire breathers did CrossFit and it was just like crazy thing that they were doing. And, um, anyway, they had like 800 abs and I thought that, yeah, I was like, uh, you want me to do what, what is this? This is a fad. <laughs> this is 12 years ago. And, um, I took my first class and I just, I fell in love with, um, the personalization of it. Um, cause and somebody like, I didn't have to think about anything. It's like, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. And then, um, how you're going to do it. And that was it. So I got hooked the first time. And then all of a sudden the competition part of me started coming back out again. So I just stuck with it. So went full send. Yes, of course. Like many do when you find CrossFit and you love it and you just go (laughs) all in. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so, Lindsay, from there, I mean, taking that first class, just being hooked right off the bat, um, did you know right then that you wanted to try and pursue this path uh, for CrossFit as a coach? Or did you, like you said, with regionals, want to go first all in as an athlete? Or did both kind of work in tandem? Yeah. So first, let's talk about my level of actual fitness when I first started CrossFit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. So I think when people start CrossFit, they either um, have a moment of like, wake up call like yep I need to do something because something's gone terribly wrong or they run away and they're like I gotta get that before I start CrossFit um it was the wake up call for me because you know we have a little warm-up run and it was 400 meters I was 25 years old at this point and I had to walk and in my brain literally and I I say this at seminars when I give the first lecture of the day it's like uh, oh my gosh I couldn't run a quarter of a mile to save my life if that was necessary. And, um, that's what happened to me, 
you know, what is going on? I wasn't like super overweight. I definitely had some excess things going on, but uh, just no capacity anymore. And um, during this time, I remember just side note, I remember like going to the gym and like going to a pool and like sw- just swimming for a little bit, like doing a few laps and being absolutely like devastated mm. pre cross <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, in the very beginning, um, you know, it was really about me, um, honestly, um, and what it did for, you know, my body, obviously, physically, but then over time, you know, you start to pick out people that you have like mindset um, or capacities in the gym, and you're like, oh, I think I could do a little bit more than that. Um, and in the very beginning, honestly, I did not want to coach. I did not want to have anything to do with anything that I had, I had to take care of other people's, like, you know, mental capacity with inside the gym, be responsible for anybody in that way. But I was encouraged they, um, by my mentorship in the gym that I started at, and they're like, hey, I think you'd be really good at this. I didn't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, finally I ended up um, started coaching and I 1000% dove head first into that and I found, because I found that other people's successes were far more rewarding than my own mm-hmm. and I loved what this sport did for me not only physically but mentally um, pulled me out of some bad places that I was in at that time and I wanted to share that experience with other people and then you know fast forward to now like this is, it infiltrates every aspect of my life. I, I don't know what I would do. It literally has changed. I don't know where I would be if CrossFit hadn't entered my life at that time, to be honest. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. It's been very profound for my life. I'm getting emotional. What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> and that's <laughs> fine. I mean, it's, it's crazy too. I mean, something just enters your life and it impacts you in such a huge way. And of course, at the time, you can't possibly comprehend how much of an impact it's going to have. But then you can reflect back at different periods in your life and realize, wow, this, I mean, this changed the trajectory of where I was going. This changed my life for the better. 1,000%. Yeah. 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Lindsay, then from that time where you were unable to complete the warm-up run and just really struggling, but then making that (laughs) mental shift of still loving CrossFit, wanting to go all in, full send, how did then you make that shift of initially I want to be or when did it happen that you wanted to become a a CrossFit athlete? You wanted to really go in and see how much you could do athletically b- prior to becoming a coach prior to that entering the story. Yeah. So this changed for me in 2000. So I started in 2008 and 2009 is when I actually, I think, witnessed my first competition and it was the sectional, this is pre the open, this is, it was a sectional um, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And this is the first time I think I really experienced the camaraderie that happens um, at the competition environment um, when things are a little bit smaller and intimate and it was like everybody just throwing down and cheering for everybody. And um, it was a sectional and I just watched these badass ladies. I was just like, Holy, and this is like when 185 deadlifts for reps were super heavy and <laughs> and and late and ladies with handstand push-ups was unheard of and um you know a 24 inch box jump was like insane um you know and i just watched this go down and i just wanted to be a part of it i i was like wow this is i i want to push myself so i went there for that then i also attended the the games at the ranch that was the last year at the ranch before they moved to Carson in 2009. Um, so in Aromas, California, and I watched, I mean, even more fit individuals and you know, obviously like it's all relative. So every you know year it's like, Oh my gosh, can people do any more? It's amazing. The human capacity. But at that time, like what they were doing was completely insane. I'll never forget watching the hill run and seeing um, Lindsay Smith and like, looking at everybody's abs <laughs> <laughs> and just like people really laying it down and like giving it their all and just like suffering together and still high-fiving and chest bumping, whatever. And I just really wanted to be a part of that. So um, just inside the gym, just slowly started ramping that up. I had other people that were in the gym that wanted to be competitive too or already were competitive. So that kind of fostered that environment as well for me. Um, and so ended up competing on our regional team, uh, for the first time in 2010. Um, that didn't go so well for me. (laughs) So, uh, after that, like I didn't want to be like the weak link on the team and it was just fuel for the fire for the years after that. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's really how it started. Just witnessing competition and like 
seeing how cool it was and then just wanting to push myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having that that drive and like you said, that competitive nature coming out of you again, something that probably, I mean, in an athletic context, wasn't alive in you since before you were a freshman and then in high school and then bringing it back. Yeah. So getting really mm-hmm. invigorated by that. And so then from there, Lindsay, not wanting to be deciding, I'm not going to be the weak link on this team. I'm going to see what I can do. How did then that set you up for um, following years? Did you continue to compete in regionals? Was your goal ultimately the games? What was uh, going on in your head at that time? Yeah, so um, after 2010, I we went back to our regionals uh, five more times, so six years in a row. Wow. Um, yeah, and it and and looking back, like hell yeah, like I literally got the T-shirt for that. Cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so moving forward, like I was typically like the smaller athlete on the team, and there was always somebody vying for that like third spot. And so for me, it really it pushed me. Um, to want to put in the work in the gym. And I'm, I think there's a couple, I think there's two types of people when it comes to like training competition, there's people that like, you know, they're all right in training, but then when it's three, two, one, like it's really go time, like competition, they can set their mind, they have the right mindset and they can really push. So for me, that was my mentality. And there's some people that do really well in training and then just fall apart when it's competition time. Um, so I feel like I'm, you know, the the first one that I talked about. So I try to push in the gym. I try to keep up with with the people there. And I just try to elevate myself each year. And I think because of the people that I was around, I was able to do that because people were better than me. And, um, uh, you know, obviously that training environment is incredibly crucial for success. I mean, that's why, you know, if you look at Rich Froning and everything that they have going on there, all the athletes go train together because it's beneficial to be around people that will push you in that way. And so it just elevated every single year. Um, I did qualify as an individual in 2012. I still chose team that year. Um, and I'm glad I did because it was by far my, my favorite year because just we were on point as a team. So wow. um, we wanted to go to the games, but obviously like, Every year it gets exponentially different. Um, and then when they turn it into the super region, um, you know, then it's like really huge. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last year I competed on the team, um, I had, it was basically a rookie team besides me. So I had basically the same, at least the ladies were all the same on the teams previous. So I had the same girls for five years running, which, you know, I don't need to know what she's doing. I already know with my eyes closed how she's performing and what I, where I need to pick up for her, which is something that really solid teams have. Like, you know what moves your teammates are going to make. Um, but I didn't have that in 2015, and so that was, like, a super big learning curve, like, for myself. And after that, I wanted to go individual. But then I had some life changes, and I didn't end up um, – doing that. So that, I think that's one regret that I have. So <laughs> really, yeah. And I mean, it's, yeah. um, again, like reflecting back on, on the journey. So then when you do look back then at 2015, when you decided you wanted to go individual, do you ever, did you ever look back then at 2012? Um, when you had already qualified as an individual, but chose to go team, did you ever wish, even though you said that year was such a great year for your team, do you ever wish you had actually tried to go individual that year? So that's an interesting question because I've I've been asked that before. And the answer is no, Mm -hmm. because I would have been destroyed. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That was the year that they introduced like the single arm. Like it was, I think for dudes, it was like a hundred pound single arm, like dumbbell snatch, which was not ever a thing. So 70 for girls. And I have the smallest hands in the world. (laughs) And so like, I couldn't even like hook grip the 75 70 pound dumbbell that we had to use. So I would have been out. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so no, the answer is not only that, but like, like I said, reflecting back on that year as a team, by far my favorite, my favorite year. So, mm-hmm. um, man, no, I don't. Um, I do regret not going, not sticking with it for 2016 individual. Um, and I know that like, I, you know, who knows what would have happened if I would have done individual for um, for a year? I don't know. Maybe I would have been inspired to, you know, I prove something to myself to then maybe try for the games. But, man, those people are so dang fit. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Woo, girl. I mean, and regional, regional individuals are incredibly impressive as well. So it's not, 
yeah anyway yeah yeah you're right. And I mean, it's and it's easy to think like, like, OK, well, what if I did this and, and reflecting back within two, um, looking on where it brought you today in your coaching career and what you're doing as, you know, beyond the world as an athlete. And so at that time, Lindsay, then when you were making that decision back in 2015 and you said too that initially when coaching was presented to you, it was something you didn't want to entertain, didn't want to get mm-hmm. into that space. Well, then how then did you kind of navigate that transition? How did you ultimately flip from being an athlete into into that coaching role? Yeah, so I was, I started coaching pretty much, uh, actually a little bit before I wanted to start thinking about competing, I think, um, or right around the same time. It happens at the same time, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that grew along with my competition drive at the same time, because I got hired on HQ staff it's about seven and a half years ago now. We're going to go on eight years soon. And um, um, so I've been on summer stuff and then coaching for longer than that inside an affiliate environment. Um, and I think for me, like the competition side enhanced my coaching side because you can demonstrate the things for the class and the better mover you are, the better you can represent that to your athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't like a, I stopped, con- it stopped competing and then I was more focused on my coaching. That's not exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. What did happen was that seminar staff for me picked up when I didn't have a season anymore. So once um, that transition was made after 2015, um, so previous to that, let me backtrack, during the open and regionals, I didn't really work that often for on the weekends for some, I coached with an affiliate. Absolutely. Yeah. But I needed to be home because otherwise traveling and all that stuff, it really messes with your routine. And also if you're a team athlete, you need to train uh, weird with your team. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's important. So I stayed home more frequently, but then when that ended, that is when we can travel. Like I would work 50 weekends a year. Wow. Um, yeah, it was just a lot. It was super awesome. Right. <laughs> also does a number on your fitness. Let's, right. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, and I think I think if you ask any seminar staff person that travels ex- a lot, they will tell you the same thing. Yeah. So just get ready because your food gets weird and, you know, you're not home. You don't have the routine again. So I think that was the biggest transition as far as between coaching and training was concerned. Yeah. And that makes sense. Mentally, I mean, yeah. Mentally, that's different. We can go there next if you want. <laughs> yes, I would love to. And then before we go there, how did you initially get involved with seminar staff? How was that? I mean, of course, working in tandem with being an athlete and a coach and an affiliate, but then seminar staff is, of course, something entirely different. So how did you find yourself initially on that journey? Yeah, so um, my... I was very fortunate um, with the gym that I grew up in and then obviously owning affiliates in Las Vegas. Um, I, I had really good mentorship, um, really good mentorship. And that means that um, the person that I was mentored by the most, uh, he was also on seminar staff. And so um, Dave Castro used to come to our gym quite a bit because um, obviously Vegas and then um, he was in San Diego or SoCal at that time. And, um, he would come to the gym quite a bit and we would host seminars at our gym and I just loved watching everything and I was around that environment and I took the level one many times before um, actually asking to, to intern and then I just, Dave came to the gym one day and I was like, I'm just going to ask, like, how else am I going to, you know, make this happen? So yeah, I asked and he was like, okay, you can intern. It's a little bit more formal now <laughs> <laughs> as far as that stuff's concerned. A little few more requirements, but um that's how I got the shot. And then, and then I get, you know, in the very beginning, you're always like, I don't belong here. What am I doing? Oh my gosh. Are you sure you want me? I'm a preschooler. I literally, this is my thoughts. I was a preschooler amongst scholars. That's what I felt like. And, um, but I guess they saw something in me and the, once you're in, like they spend a significant amount of time developing you. Like I don't know any other businesses or companies that do that and bless, bless them because um, I really wouldn't be where I'm at coaching wise if it wasn't for all the, the excellent mentors, not only that I grew up in my own gym, but also like on seminar staff. I just, they're just the best humans on the planet. I would argue with anybody. So <laughs> 
And that's I anyway. mean, amazing to have people pour into you like that. But then too, I think you hit on something so many people feel in, in navigating those transitions, that imposter syndrome that sets in, you don't belong there. I don't yes. feel like I'm good enough to be here. But then having those people around you reminding you of, no, you are meant to be here. You've chosen this path for a reason. It's those reminders that are, no, you are good enough. You are worthy. You can do mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, Lindsay, then, I mean, you touched on um, flashing forward back to 2015. I mean, navigating then that the physical toll that starting to travel more and um, and and getting really full fledged into being on seminar staff and then coaching, too. But then you said too the the mental toll that was happening there. So what was going on in your head at that time? Yeah, so uh, when you and I've and I've watched oh, this is interesting. So I've watched like Lindy Barber's transition away from being a competitive athlete to like being like, hey, if I'm doing this for health and wellness, mm-hmm. as you know, ninety nine percent of humans on the planet that do CrossFit, um, it is weird and super not weird, but like incredibly challenging to not compare yourself to where you used to be or how you used to train and finding a purpose for training. Oh my gosh. Hmm. So hard. So hard. I I struggled. And I honestly, I I struggled with it for like several years after not competing. I think number one, I went through a phase of this is where I should be. And I'm beating myself up for not continuing to be an individual but I'm just not in the right training environment nor am I like motivated to train but I'm still comparing myself to this athlete that I was Mm. so I went through that phase and then I was just like depressed all the time because I wasn't hitting numbers like I should have or my gymnastics suffered a little bit or whatever even though I'm still incredibly fit right you just are like this is not where I was I should be making gains like I should be still increasing so then the open would come around and you would treat it like you were going to compete, even though you're not really competing, you're not doing it for anything. So like, okay, let's do it multiple times. Oh, I'm just upset with my results all the time. This isn't fun for me anymore. So then you're just like beating yourself up, stressed out. And for what? For no reason. And you just like, you try to tell yourself that not to be like that, mm-hmm. but there's something so ingrained with being competitive and trying to get to the next level uh, against yourself, against your form, you know. Um, you can't help it. And then it it literally, it took me probably until like last year, I hate saying that, but uh, last year with the two opens, that was the first year I actually really just was in the moment with the events and whatever I got was what I got. And I enjoyed doing it with the community and I didn't beat myself up afterwards. I was like, you know what? We're just going to have fun. And it was the first time. Now, now, it's different. And I'll tell you why in a minute. (laughs) Yes. I would love to know why. But I think you hit on, Lindsay, something so key because it's when you transition from no longer being that competitive athlete, of course, it's still a piece of you and and the things that you learned are going to help um, help you whatever path you choose to go down next. But it's a constant battle. No matter where you find yourself in your life, you're constantly thinking about that athlete that you were, even if you are this incredible coach and incredible, per, per, incredible person outside of your athletic career, it's still something that can nag at you and still be there. And it's, it's that oh, constant yeah. thing that's going to be there. And it's like you said, you have to decide, okay, I'm just going to be in the moment I am going to to live here and I'm I'm just going to enjoy this for what it is. It's so hard to do that. And you just end up beating yourself up. You feel kind of like a, you feel a little bit of like a shell. You're like, what, what is my purpose? What am I doing? You know, and then trying to, trying to find something uh, to train for. You're like, why am I, what am I doing? Like, why am I, okay, I get it. I'm for health and wellness, but I've had such lofty goals and I need to hit this number and do this thing. It's like, what am I doing now? And then it's really hard to keep motivation, you know? And I went through yeah. on struggles and lulls and training and didn't want to train and, you know, ugh, yeah, it was rough. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine navigating that and being this elite competitor and then having to make that shift. And so do you remember, was there something specifically that happened last year that really um, helped you navigate that and decide, okay, I'm just going to be in the moment. I'm going to have fun in the open. Um, Or was it, do you think it was just the passage of time that allowed that allowed you to arrive at that place? Probably a little bit of both. Honestly, like 
you know, with everybody, there's always things that are going on uh, in your life. And there's a few things that happened at the beginning of 2019 that, ha- that were beyond my control. And I think, honestly, I think 2019 kind of prepared me for 2020, to be honest. <laughs> you know, um, you know that to let, th- let some things go that I outside of your control like don't stress out about it if you can't do anything about it and I think for me it's like well this is the energy that you've put into training or not so much energy to putting into training so don't be surprised with the result and that's okay know where you're at and just have fun Mm -hmm. just I I think having fun again was really like the focus and I think and again combination of time happening that you know just kind of relaxing of where I'm at like I'm still I'm still in the top 10%. Like, stop it. Like, right. right. <laughs> it's okay. It's it's going to be okay. So um, I think those things kind of helped navigate that. So, and around being, being around good people, you know, yeah, you know, the positive attitudes in that, that realm. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's, Again, it's having those right people in your corner and surrounding yourself with them who can, they can remind you when you forget. And then too, you said, I mean, you're still in the top 10% and it's having kind of that, that gut check of, okay, no, you're still amazing. You're so great. You're so worthy. You're still enough. Um, you might mm-hmm. not be competing anymore, but you are now shifting your focus into something bigger, something different and just this new path with, with coaching and being on seminar staff and, and growing through the realm of CrossFit just in a different capacity than you had initially intended. Ended. Right, right, absolutely. So, Lindsay, then from you said 2019 um, prepared you for what 2020 is. I mean, just kind of the craziness. <laughs> so, um, last year when you had that realization with the opens and um, just everything going on, how how would you say that it prepared you for this year, and then ultimately leading you to um, where you're at today as the head coach at CrossFit Rife? Yeah. So. Um, Again, it just helped me kind of let go of some things that are outside of my control, which has been this entire year, you know, like, right. <laughs> oh, oh, weird zombies are a thing. Yep. Okay, cool. We'll just roll with that because it's cool. that's where we're at right now. Right. Murder hornets, no big deal. Can't control that either. All right. That's what we're doing. Um, so, uh, you know, that helped for sure this year. Um, I had some other things happen that were unexpected and um, it just ended up working out like Jason, you know few years ago, uh, the owner of CrossFit Rife, who just jokingly was like, you should come work for me. And I was like, ha ha ha, no. And <laughs> <laughs> like, I like where I'm at. I'm doing my thing, you know, living in the mountains. And then, um, it's funny how unfulfilled, it's funny how you don't realize how unfulfilled you are until you're fulfilled again. Mm. And, uh, that's really what's happened here. Um, you know, COVID hit, he threw it out there again. Some other things happened and I was like, well, maybe I'll look into this. And I came to visit and honestly, like this gym environment, um, at Rife is exactly, um, felt like what I had at max effort at my gyms in Vegas. And, um, that, that environment, I, I haven't felt like that since I left. And so to be, I, I knew right away, like after taking a few classes and just being around the community here and being involved in a place that, you know, take, takes coaches coaching seriously, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, takes care of its humans here. That was, um, it was easy to say yes to be here. And so, um, consequently, you know, I am in a really good place and really freaking happy and an amazing training environment. So, you know, your girl's getting competitive again. So well, there you go. There you, <laughs> you go. Can't, you can't help it. Not saying I'm going to do anything with it, but I do be looking at scores on the board and I'm like, all right, who am I going to chase today? <laughs> You know, and, and it's, um, I'm motivated. I'm just, it's a joy to be in the gym again. Like I had Mm -hmm. lost that. I had lost that for a while. And so I'm not going to say that, like, I'm not when the open comes up this, uh, you know, February, the beginning of the year that I'm, I'm definitely going to be in a different mindset again this year, but I think it's a healthy one, not like one where I'm going to compare myself, but like, I'm going to compare myself to not the former athlete that I was when I was still competing, but like last year. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, I'm crushing this and then I'm going to continue that path. So it's been, it's been, it's been, I can't really describe the amount of happiness and gratitude that I have for this move. So, yeah. I love that. And it's, I mean, you're right. It's amazing. And it's, that's not bad to be back in that competitive mindset because like you said, it's a renewed place. It's not that same place of comparison and, and kind of 
taking your joy away because you're constantly comparing yourself to your old self. It's realizing, Mm -hmm. no, I've arrived at a new place in my life and I'm competitive again. I want to be this great athlete because I am now um, in a place where I can be fostered and become and still live into being this great coach that I want to be. And then two, I mean, like you said, working on seminar staff and everything that you're doing, it's, it's all aligning. And I love what you said. It's when you realize how unfulfilled you are when you become fulfilled again. And that's just, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so poignant because I guess you might not even realize that you're unfulfilled <laughs> I mean in the moment exactly no really exactly and and I think too on the training side for like you know being competitive or whatever like I I'm enjoying training like I literally want I, there I went through, through a phase where I didn't want to do any of it I was like eh, I'm all set <laughs> it was super it was super minimal and now I'm like yes let's do this you know so yeah. it's it's a different yeah yeah I love that. And so, Lindsay, when did you officially make the change, um, the shift from your move into CrossFit Rife as the head coach? Yeah, so I moved to Virginia Beach August 17th, I think that was. So I've been here for like six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, six weeks. So it's still new, still fresh. (laughs) Yeah, it's 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 great. <laughs> and it's amazing though that you in only 6 weeks you realized all of this. I mean, having this life shift and knowing I was unfulfilled, I'm now fulfilled again and getting to pursue this new journey. And that's how you know, I mean, I think that's how you oh. know it's right, you know. Girl, the first week, the first <laughs> week I was like, "Oh, I'm where I need to be. Yeah. I I this is all right. This is home." Yeah, what we're doing. Oh, I so. love that. Man, I love that. Yeah. Cuz it's just yes. Yep, all about it. <laughs> so, Lindsay, mm-hmm. now, I mean, um just with everything going on, but looking forward, um what what is next for you? I mean, for with CrossFit Rife, with I mean, continuing with, with seminar staff, looking forward to, you know, being more competitive again this year. What's on the horizon for you? Yeah, so um honestly, like obviously I've been here for 6 weeks, so right. I'm still settling into my role here. Um, the coaching side isn't stuff. It's it's the other things that I do outside of the coaching classes and, um, you know, personal training and on-ramping people. But um, it's the business side of things and the community side that I take care of that I'm still growing, um, growing into that role. So I'll continue to try to um, add additional things to the plate to help rife the community grow here Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that the experience that the athletes are getting and, you know, retention and all of that stuff stays really strong. So contributing to the team environment here between um, the staff at Rife. um, And then also as far as seminar staff, like hopefully continuing to do that, you know, COVID has been weird with travel. So obviously like I want to keep doing those things. Um, I know that we're starting to offer, um, I don't know if it's going to be limited or if we're going to keep doing it, but it's going to be uh, the online. We're going to do um, a online level one. We did it for people who are going to renew. Okay. Um, but now they're going to be offering it, I believe, to um, first timers because of restrictions in certain locations. So hopefully doing some more of that. Um, however, I need to find some balance. So I think that's like moving forward as far as like working midweek and then also having my job on a weekend where I'm in an affiliate now. So I'm, I want to socialize here too. So I need to find some balance there. Right. Athletically, athletically, I'm just going to keep showing up. That's what I wasn't doing. And when I was unmotivated and so I'm just going to keep showing up and, um, you know, progressively moving back towards RX loading and RX gymnastics and all of that stuff, which is already happening. It's so crazy to me when you scale appropriately, how quickly fitness comes back and how um, quickly uh, your body remembers what to do. So within six weeks, I'm already hitting workouts as prescribed again. Um, The goal for next year, I'm hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. With one of my former, t- yeah, with one of my former teammates that I used to compete with, uh, no better person because she never used to complain about anything with training ever. So I was like, great. I know that when I want to complain, you're not going to. So then I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's been something that's motivating for me for training as well this year. Like I can't go hike a mountain and not have fitness. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's been kind of like a, that's been a goal. Um, but yeah, grow more, grow more in my role here at Rife. Um, take on some more responsibilities with that. Um, and then Kilimanjaro next year, dude. And then just continue to like have fun, you know, yes. 
Yeah. yeah, I'll be here for I'll be here for the foreseeable future. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that you found a home and just finding that balance. And of course, too, because you have to take care of Moose, your new dog. <laughs> yes, oh, he's so great. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, puppy phase right now. Oh, sleep is a struggle. And, um, <laughs> I bet. Yeah, but it's fun. He's great. Yeah, great things are wonderful. He's yeah. precious. His his paws are so big. He's so dopey. He's gonna, <laughs> huge. He's gonna be so big, but uh, I'm excited. Yeah, so, that's yeah, great. I love that. Well, Lindsay, looking back and having accomplished everything you did and navigating all these transitions and having it lead you and being willing to step through those doors of opportunity and creating some for yourself and looking forward, having these aspirations and knowing of course you're going to achieve so much more um but i just have one final question that i ask all of my interviewees what do you want to be remembered for kind of backtracking to like a goal moving forward this is going to sound interesting because it's not like a professional like like i feel like i'm i'm good you know professionally i'll still grow in my position with with rife um of course and i can i can go further with 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 hq too if i ever get put in a flow master position but honestly, this year has taught me that um, relationships um, are super incredibly important to me and that I have honestly have sacrificed a lot to work more. And <laughs> and it sounds interesting because I've not taken on this like responsibility midweek as well as the weekends, but I want to slow down in other places so that I can foster relationships. And so I think that could lead me into like, what do I want to be remembered for? Like I want, I think I want... I, I don't care about, I don't want to be remembered for what I did physically or like, Oh, she was a cool athlete. No, that's not what I want to be remembered for. That's not the mark that I want to leave. Uh, the mark I want to leave is like, she helped me in my journey or she helped me realize, um, something about myself. Um, cause she cared. I think that's what I really, I think that's the mark I want to leave. I want to be remembered for like caring for humans, um, in a profound way. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our guest, check out the show notes at keepmovingforward.us. While you're there, go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on all things coming out of the KMF Collective Studio. Always remember, you can beat the odds and go the distance. If only you keep moving forward. <laughs>